This is the second lecture for Wednesday, April 15th. We're looking at these different ecosystems, looking at the deep sea, looking at this feature that's characteristic of most of the deep sea where there's not very much energy, or in other words, low biomass. And we saw that one of the adaptations for low biomass that's very common in deep sea organisms is neutral buoyancy. Two different approaches, reducing the amount of heavy matter or increasing the amount of light matter. Things that are heavier than water, the typical density of seawater is about 1.027 grams per cubic centimeter. If you think about, you, you guys all know this, but the density of pure water is 1, 1.000. So a density of 1.027 it doesn't seem like it's that much different, but it's certainly more dense than one. So that's the density of seawater. If you look at the density of these other tissues below the density of seawater, dense matter, organs, it varies depending on the organs, but organs have a typical density of 1.09. That's pretty heavy in comparison to seawater. Skin, 1.1. 1.19. That's heavier than seawater. Muscle is really heavy. Skeleton is even heavier. All of those things are dense. All of those things tend to make an animal sink. So those are reduced. There's not much you can do with organs, but you can have more flabby skin. You can have less muscle and more flabby body in general. And you can have a reduced skeleton, less calcium in particular. And those are things that, that happen in deep sea organisms. It makes you lighter, makes you less dense, makes you more buoyant. That's one approach. The other thing that you could do is store low density matter in your body. So one of the things that's low density, that's very, very common in all kinds of different deep sea organisms is lipid or oil. And there's low density lipids that are stored in a whole bunch of different parts of the bodies that increase their buoyancy. Ovaries are light compared to testes. Testes are heavier than water. Ovaries are actually lighter than water because they contain a certain amount of, of uh, lipid, oil, as a source of nutrition for the, the young. And then water. Now, water, depending on the solute concentration, is going to have a different density. But you can alter the composition of water that's in your body even slightly, and it will be less dense than the seawater you're in. If anything, water is going to be the same density as the seawater you're in. So if you're storing up water, if you're replacing those dense matter substances with water, especially in order to maintain the same size or to be big, to reduce the risk of predation, then you're still contributing to neutral buoyancy. So those are some of the things that can be dealt with. Well, let's look at this. This is a slide that we saw the other day, but these are the two approaches. Well, not the other day, but in the other lecture. How do you become neutrally buoyant or how do you reduce your density? Typically, animals are, are heavier than seawater. It's fine if you want to lay on the bottom. In fact, it's a good thing if you want to lay on the bottom. But if you're in the water column, you don't want to be heavier than water. Now, you can't have the same solution as shallow water organisms, shallow water fish in particular, that either have a swim bladder that negates this being more dense than seawater, or swim all the time. If you swim all the time, then you can maintain your position in the water column. Now, deep sea fish, they can't have a swim bladder filled with air. Shallow water fish have a swim bladder filled with air, and if they don't have a swim bladder, in some species that move up and down the water column quickly, the swim bladder is not a good thing to have because they can't change the volume of the swim bladder fast enough. They have lifting surfaces. They're swimming all the time. 
they encounter a lot of food, they have a high rate of consumption, they can support that high rate of activity. In the deep sea, that's not possible. You don't have things that are swimming around very quickly. You have things that are moving a lot more slowly. So let's look at this idea of reduce, reduced dense matter. How do you do that? Well, there's certain things that are pumped out of the body of deep sea organisms. For instance, ions. There's ions that are heavier than seawater, or at least they're heavier. If you change the composition of ions in your body, you can make yourself lighter. So there's a number of invertebrates that pump heavy ions out of their body, and they replace them with ions that are lighter. And what it does, it makes a, a, at least some contribution to them being lighter, being lower density, being more buoyant, and being able to achieve this goal of neutral buoyancy. If you look at fish, if you look at sharks in general, they have a lower amount of calcium and these heavy things that they incorporate in their skeleton, especially calcium, though. Even invertebrates, like mollusks, have a, a reduction in the amount of calcium carbonate in their shells. Less heavy matter then brings you to become lower density, helps you to become more buoyant. And another thing is the uh, skeleton. Skeleton, if you think about the skeleton, it's, a, it's calcified matter. It's heavy. It's got a minerals in it. So if you look at the skeleton of deep sea fish, it tends to be less calcium, less dense. If you look at the density of deep sea sharks, now they don't have bones. They're cartilaginous. Even in this cartilage, though, this cartilage is calcified. But there's a lot less calcium, a lot less calcification in the cartilaginous skeleton of deep sea sharks. There's a lot of different species of deep sea sharks. They also have a flabby skin, less heavy skin. Now, the skin of shallow water sharks is like sandpaper. It's very, you can't even cut it with a knife sometimes. But here's a picture of a deep sea shark skin. This was caught in a trawl, in a net. And brought up from the depths and the, you can see the skin is so thin and flabby that it gets torn ripped from being in the trawl this would never happen to a shallow water shark because of the increased calcification all those these little dermal denticles that they have in their skin there's an x-ray that shows a shallow water shark the tail of a shallow water shark you can see the vertebrate the vertebrae that are calcified, it's dark in that x-ray in figure B. In figure A, above it, that's a, an x-ray of the same part of a deep water shark. You, you can see the vertebrae, but you can't even see the tail of this shark because the degree of calcification is so much less. So, reduction of heavy matter, whether that's ions or whether it's your skin or your skeleton, that all these things increase your buoyancy and help you to obtain neutral buoyancy and help you save energy. These are all adaptations that you find in the deep sea, deep sea organisms, very common. Another thing goes a long way towards increasing your buoyancy, making you neutral buoyant, neutrally buoyant. So you can float, save energy, just hang around basically, not laying on the bottom, but hang around in the water column until you come across something to eat, is increasing light matter. So there's some things that are capable of using gas at depth for buoyancy, but it's not very common. You have to have some kind of a structure that's not a flabby body. This swim bladder that's so effective, so widespread in shallow water fish, it's out for most species of fish. It's not possible to use a gas-filled swim bladder for buoyancy in the deep sea. A lot of fish have swim bladders in the deep sea, but a common thing is that they fill their swim bladders, not with air, but they fill their swim bladders with lipid, low-density matter that helps them 
attain neutral buoyancy. So gas floats a very small degree. But one thing that's really, 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 really common is some kind of oil or some kind of low-density lipid that you find in, in the bodies of these deep-sea animals. If you look at fish, all these different species of deep-sea fish, some of them, like sharks, store a lot of oil in their liver. There's, there's bony fish that do the same thing. If you look at the the uh, a number of different types of deep sea fish, some of them have a bunch of lipid that's stored in their head, around their cranium. Some of them have lipid that's stored in their muscle. Some of them store lipid in their bones. Some of them have lipid deposits underneath their skin. And as I said, there's a number of deep sea bony fish that fill their swim bladder with lipid. All of those things are light and they provide buoyancy and they help deep sea organisms attain neutral buoyancy. Very important for dealing with this environmental condition of low biomass, a little bit of energy. And another thing that I mentioned before is you can store water in your body. You can be a certain size so that you can reduce predation. You can not have to expend all this energy moving around. And you can replace tissue that's metabolically costly, or in other words, has a high metabolic rate, uses a lot of energy. You can get rid of some of that tissue, especially muscle, and replace it with water. Water is not very expensive to have in your body. And so you can become neutrally buoyant and you can conserve energy. So those are some of the main things you find in deep sea organisms. So in the deep sea, there's uh, a lot of soft sediment where you find things that or deposit feeders that are going along. There's all this energy that is from above, like dead whales. There's a whole bunch of little phytoplankton that sinks down, little zooplankton, little fish, little squid. All these things sink down to the bottom. Not so noticeable, but here's a, a whale. What's left of a whale carcass. There's these different octopus species that are there. There's different species of fish. There's different species of, of uh, cartilaginous fish. They're all oriented to this. So you're going to see some octopus. You're going to see some chimeras, those cartilaginous fish that are closely related to sharks. There's a chimera swimming by. There's eels that are common down here. You see hagfish, some of these places. So you see nobody swimming around at, at top speed. That's the way of life, laying around, saving energy. So some of these, they don't have to worry about buoyancy so much, but some of these are swimming. They're up in the water column. All right, well, let's look at this last topic of hydrothermal vents. These hydrothermal vents are a, a whole different type of ecosystem that was discovered not that long ago, back in the late 70s. In fact, URI's Bob Ballard was involved in some of this. Well, at least he was out there, part of the, explana the uh, exploration, the guy that found the Titanic. That's why he's famous, URI, Graduate School of Oceanography. But there's these hydrothermal vents where these uh, we looked at these tectonic plates where they're, they're spreading apart. New crust is being formed. And so you have this magma, lava, that's coming up towards the, the surface. And it's very hot. And it heats up the water to very high levels. And so you've got this really hot water. And you've got this... A different kind of uh, composition of the of the seawater, where there's a lot of silicates and hydrogen sulfide, 
and magnesium and iron, these different, uh, these different metals. And so if you look at what's found there in terms of living things, there's a lot of biomass, there's a lot of diversity, and there's some symbiotic relationships. There's organisms there that are making their way of life, making their living very differently than throughout their whole rest of the deep sea. They're not necessarily sitting around waiting for a whale to sink down to the bottom and feed on it. They're not floating along very slowly. That's not the typical way of life there. They're in this really hot, superheated water with this special type of composition, and it gives them an opportunity to have access to chemicals that they can use in place of light to generate ATP, chemoautotrophs. So there's a, these different tube worms, especially some bivalve mollusks. Some of them have bacteria incorporated in their tissues. And, and there's uh, some really interesting ecological relationships going on here. But it all starts with the ability of these organisms to obtain energy from these chemicals that are in the water, which is unusual. Now, there's bacteria that do this in shallow water in these anoxic environments. It's bacteria that are chemoautotrophs. Think about if you're a living thing, you need ATP for energy. You need ATP to support your processes that go on inside of all your cells. Well, there's a couple different answers to being able to make ATP. One of them that we're familiar with are, is photosynthetic organisms. So in this figure on the right, where this yellow is, there's a light that comes from the sun. There's these, these uh, photosynthetic organisms that have pigments like chlorophyll that are excited and the electrons store energy, though that energy is used to make ATP. That ATP is used to make sugar. So there's a lot of, that's what photosynthetic organisms do. There's also organisms like all the way on the left that use some kind of uh, food to make ATP. So this is us. This is animals. This is most of the organisms out there that aren't photosynthetic. You take some a sugar like glucose in the presence of oxygen and you make ATP. The end products are carbon dioxide and water. That is cellular respiration that you learn about in some biology class. In the middle there, you're not using light and you're not using glucose. You're not feeding on something else. You're not using light, but you're making ATP nevertheless. So you have these chemosynthetic organisms. These are bacteria. This is the third way to make ATP. It's not very widespread and it's not responsible for very much energy production. But in these hydrothermal vents, this is a source of energy. You can take chemicals, break the bonds in those chemicals, those molecules, and just like you're using light to make ATP, you can break the bonds in these chemicals and use that energy, the energy that's given off when these bonds are broken. You can harvest that energy and use that energy to make ATP. So it's a source of energy in these hydrothermal vents, very unusual compared to the rest of the ocean. So this is, this is what I was talking about before, that you've got photosynthesis, which is how energy makes its way into all these different ecosystems that we've looked at so far. Estuaries, coral reefs, the, the ocean, open ocean, phytoplankton, algae, flowering plants, cyanobacteria, they're all photosynthetic. They all have chloroplasts. They've got some kind of a photopigment like chlorophyll, and they use that to make ATP. And they use ATP to join carbons together in the Calvin cycle there to make sugar. Well, if you look at chemosynthesis, in terms of these hydrothermal vent animals, it's a whole different type of setup where you've got, especially hydrogen sulfide, they can break the bonds 
between those molecules and use that energy to make ATP. And they can take that ATP to join carbons together to make sugars. That's what the input of energy is. So it's very unusual. And uh, as I said, it happens in some shallow water places, anoxic environment where bacteria do this. But in these hydrothermal vent communities, you've got a whole bunch of different organisms that can do that. The water is superheated. It's got these chemicals that can be used. So look at some of the animals you find there, especially these, these uh, worms that have this bacteria all throughout their tissues, these tube worms. So this is what you find there. You find crabs that are feeding on these, mussels. You've got shrimp. You've got uh, octopus that you find there, fish. But these tube worms, with all of this bacteria in their tissues, it's similar in a way to coral with those zooxanthella. But in this case, they've got these bacteria that are chemosynthetic, producing sugar. The bacteria have a home. It's a symbiotic relationship. The tube worms get food, and it starts this whole process of taking energy out of the environment and incorporating it into living things. So if you go to these hydrothermal vent communities, first of all, they're very hot, very hot water that facilitates this, these processes taking place. But you've got, this doesn't show all the tube worms, but you've got crustaceans there, you've got shrimp, you've got mollusks, you've got uh, octopus there. Very productive, very diverse, very unusual. It doesn't account for very much in terms of area of the ocean or of the deep sea, but it's, it's quite a, an accomplishment. And it's a completely different ecosystem than anybody even imagined, very unusual. So it uh, generates a lot of interest. And it's, a, it's actually a separate type of ecosystem it's in the deep sea, but it's a subcategory of deep sea ecosystems. And it's very different than the vast majority of the deep sea. So here's an octopus with its eggs. There's a shrimp that's crawling around there. There's a lot of energy there. Very interesting. So that's the end of this first lecture for April 15th and the end of the deep sea.